The United States has underlined its support for Israel while making it clear it does not want to see any more escalation in the region. Here's what National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby told the U.S. broadcaster NBC. What Israel demonstrated last night was an incredible ability to defend itself. Just their own military superiority was quite uh, remarkable yesterday. Uh, I mean, very little got through and the damage was extraordinarily light. And also, I, Israel demonstrated again, as I said, that they're not standing alone, that they have friends. Uh, so the president's been clear, we don't wanna see this escalate. We don't, we're not looking for a wider war with Iran. Um, I, think, uh, I, I think, you know, the coming hours and days will, will tell us a lot. TW reporter in Washington, Stephen Simons, has this assessment. The U.S. has no interest for Israel to take any action which could possibly escalate the situation from where we are right now or where the U.S. or where Israel and Iran are right now. Um, uh, the U.S. is assessing or the White House administration um, uh, is assessing the situation as actually quite dire that if Israel is pushing this further, this could really result in a regional conflict nobody wants, the Biden administration doesn't want. However, of course, we all quoted this many times, the ironclad support for Israel that is there. The administration is adamant about repeating this, that there is absolute um, support for Israel in any defense defensive manner, if you will. Um, that means if Israel is attacked again by Iran or anybody else, the U.S. will stand by Israel helping to defend them. However, no such support, support uh, uh, promised by the U.S. if the Israel, if the war cabinet, if Benjamin Netanyahu should decide to go on the offensive here and retaliate in a way or at all, perhaps, uh, towards Iran, which would escalate the whole situation. So this is a little bit the if you will, thin line of a rope uh, the U.S. is trying to balance in here. Uh -huh. and, and the war in Gaza has already hurt Biden politically, hasn't it? Of course it has. Um, uh, Biden's uh, standing with uh, whatever happened in, or what all happened in, in October, at October 7th la uh, last year hasn't been improved or getting better. To the contrary, he is under a lot of pressure from Arab Americans who want to see Biden administration's efforts to increase and to intensify when it comes to a sustainable peace agreement or a truth agreement between Israel and, and Hamas in Gaza, the release of the hostages and more aid, humanitarian aid into Gaza. Now, the Biden administration has worked on this. There is a deal on the table for Hamas to accept for the release of hostages and for more aid and for a six-week six truth. But according to reports, Hamas has rejected that. And that means for the Biden administration back to square one. A regional conflict would really cause trouble for the Biden administration. Um, we have a presidential election year. Uh, so any conflict outside the U.S. of that magnitude uh, does not look good on the president, no matter what he does or doesn't do. And the president's hosting a G7 meeting. Uh, not only has he said, uh, pledged his ironclad support, as you put it, like he uh, did only days ago. Uh, he also talked about wanting to coordinate a united diplomatic response. What are the diplomatic options here? Well, the diplomatic options, as you know, the U.S. has no direct uh, diplomatic relations with uh, uh, Iran. The Swiss handle this for the United States. However, the U.S. still understands and sees itself as the leader of the pack when it comes to organized diplomatic responses, economic responses to any threat uh, scenario Iran or anybody else poses uh, for the region. Remember, we're talking about the Middle East, so we're talking about oil, we're talking about uh, uh, freedom of movement of ships, etc., etc. Iran could play a role there. So this G7 meeting, uh, which is handled like a Zoom meeting remotely, uh, will probably discuss possible sanctions or sanction scenarios, um, but it is foremost about really uniting a front of partners and allies of the United States in their diplomatic efforts to uh, impress on Israel not to uh, escalate this now with a disappropriate response to what happened and to impress on Iran to um, not do anything further. Uh, I think that is, uh, that is 
definitely of, of the most importance for the United States right now, leading this or uh, asking for this G7 meeting and organizing this, this diplomatic response and pressure on all parties involved there. Back here in Europe, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has responded to the Iranian assault, but he's on a trip right now to China where he'll be meeting with, among others, President Xi Jinping. Here's what he had to say a short time ago. We strongly condemn the Iranian attack and warn against any further escalation. Iran must not continue down this path. At the same time, it's absolutely clear to us that we stand in solidarity with Israel, which has every right to defend itself. We will do everything we can to prevent further escalation and will therefore continue to pursue our current course. But we can only warn everyone, especially Iran, against continuing down this path. To look at the international implications of the Iranian attack on Israel, I'm joined by uh, Richard Walker, our international chief editor. Uh, tell us more about Schultz and his meeting with Xi Jinping on Tuesday. He's hoping to get help in avoiding further escalation. Will they get that? Yeah, so, I mean, it, 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 it's really quite fascinating to see Olaf Scholz, of course, on the other side of the world at, at the moment. I mean, he's just been in Chongqing. We just saw uh, the pictures there from the, the city in China where a German company has a hydrogen facility, and he's been touring that. And you might think, well, he's, he's got other things on his mind today uh, than looking at a hydrogen factory. But I think that the Germans are saying that the fact that they get to talk to Xi Jinping, the Chinese president, on Tuesday really makes this trip worth it, even from the point of view of the this, this new risk of escalation going on. The Germans were briefing before this trip that they would be going and asking the Chinese for help to try to keep a lid on things. And this, of course, is particularly with respect to Iran, where China has a, a close relationship. And as a sign of that, it's interesting to see, so Tony Blinken, the American Secretary of State, spoke to Wang Yi, his Chinese counterpart, um, just a couple of days ago. Um, and the Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson said that China uh, condemns the attack on the Iranian embassy in Syria. So, so China very much kind of taking Iran's side uh, uh, in what the backdrop to, to what's happened here, this, this attack on the um, Iranian facility in Syria. So indicating that the Chinese feel kind of that the, the Iranians were, you know, had every right to retaliate. Mm. Now the question will be, well, you know, do, do the Chinese really want to risk a major escalation? What could that mean for them? And if you look at the Chinese economy, it is very dependent on oil imports from the Middle East. So any kind of major war that could cause disruption perhaps to oil exports through the Straits of Hormuz, for example, that could be very disruptive to China, especially at a time that its economic mm. economy is weak. So I think Schultz would be appealing on those kind of self-interested grounds as well as uh, on grounds uh, of his own commitment to Israel's defense. And you're saying that because it could cause some sort of unrest back home in China. Well, well, well China is struggling with its economy. Mm. Um, the kind of disruption that could happen to oil markets um, if there were a major conflict that, that shut down the Straits of Hormuz, that would affect China as much as any, it would affect any other oil importing country at a time when the Chinese economy is in trouble. So, so I think these are some of the undercurrents that I think Schultz will certainly be appealing on, I think. Now, the German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock said today that the Middle East was on the edge of a precipice that Iran had almost pushed the region into chaos. Let's listen in. The Iranian regime has clearly led the entire Middle East to the brink of the abyss. Iran fired over 300 rockets, drones and cruise missiles at Israel last night. We condemn in the strongest possible terms the direct Iranian attack on the territory of Israel. Germany's full solidarity extends to Israel. A stark warning there from Baerbock, Richard. Yeah, I mean, I think reflecting just this level of concern, which we've seen back to October 7th and the Hamas terrorist attack on Israel that, that really set off the, the, this, this new stage of instability in the Middle East, um, that there's been this concern that there could be a major escalation and particularly a war between Israel and Iran. And this is the closest we've been to that yet, as we've been hearing, you know, that this term unprecedented, you know, it hasn't happened before that Iran has directly attacked Israel. 
nobody really knows how that is going to change the dynamic in the region yet. So I think, you know, clear concerns here in Berlin. About and a flurry of international diplomatic activity, of course. Uh, will this be able to stop any potential escalation? Yeah, so we've got the UN Security Council meeting uh, in the afternoon New York time today. Of course, the UN Security Council has not shown itself able to really deal with the major conflicts, Ukraine, Middle East or others, uh, at the moment because it is so kind of deadlocked uh, amid the, the the greater kind of great power competition going on between the Western powers and, and Russia and China on the other hand. So I, it's quite possible that that will just descend into a kind of a blame game. The G7 will also be talking. We've heard about that already. already. I think the Western powers will want to be sending messages of reassurance to Israel that they have its back, but at the same time wanting to try to work on Israel to, to, to try to persuade it not to retaliate in a major way to what has just happened. So that's the delicate balance the Western powers are going to be trying to walk at the moment. And let's bring in Fawaz Jejas, a professor of Middle Eastern politics and international relations at the London School of Economics. Now, of course, we're talking about limited damage, but how surprised were you by the scale of Iran's attack on Israel? I was very surprised. This was a significant, uh, unprecedented attack by Iran, uh, the first time ever in history. Uh, 300 drones, ballistic missiles, uh, cruise missiles. Um, and I think what Iran uh, was trying to do is to deliver the message. Uh, and the message was delivered loud and clear. Uh, it's all about uh, restoring deterrence for Iran. Um, Iran did not really want to trigger all-out war with Israel or with the United States. And that's why it was telegraphing to the world uh, in the past 10 days that its intent to retaliate. Uh, and the fact that the United States moved major air defense capabilities to the area and the United Kingdom and France, uh, it tells you a great deal that the strategic goal of Iran was not to really do a lot of damage or kill Israelis, but rather to deliver the message that it's willing to stand up and basically retaliate for attacks by Israel against its sovereignty, um, and in particular against its consulate in Syria. OK, well, if this is all about deterrence and the message was heard loud and clear, what it, uh, sort of response do you expect then or reaction from Israel? First of all, I, I was actually, I disagree with your correspondent because General Ghan said, and this is unusual for Israelis, he said, we will respond at a time of our choosing. Uh, what he really is saying is that Iran used to say the same thing uh, in the past few years. Uh, it tells me, um, I, I don't know, I could be wrong, that obviously President Biden has impressed on Israeli Prime Minister the need to de-escalate. Uh, and I think yesterday, Israel and the top leadership came to realize that its security depends on its superpower patrons, in particular, the United States and Britain and France and a regional coalition. I mean, let's look at the, uh, what, what Jordan did. Jordan uh, basically played a major role in destroying tens of uh, drones uh, over Jordanian territories. So my hope, the Iranians said today, uh, the matter is concluded. Uh, they have no plans to escalate. Um, I take it that if Israel does not really respond in the next couple of days, I think the Middle East uh, basically uh, would have been or could have been uh, saved from a major um, explosion. I mean, a uh, all-out regional war. I'm not suggesting the risk is not there, but the next couple of days are really critical uh, to see whether... Uh, the region itself will step back from the brink or will see further escalation between um, Israel and uh, Iran and their allies, local and international allies. So, Fawaz, what sort of steps need to be taken in those next days uh, to ensure de-escalation? Well, I think, first of all, I think it all really depends on adults in the room. Uh, because I think what we are seeing now is that there are very few adults in the room. Uh, in the past six months, uh, despite everything that the Biden administration has provided for Israel, I think President Biden has failed to exercise influence or leverage over Netanyahu's war cabinet. It seems to me what we might be seeing is a game changer um, in the sense, or at least I hope, 
that not only uh, the United States now will exercise influence over decisions by Israel vis-a-vis -vis Iran, but at least bring about the end of the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza, a ceasefire, the release of Israeli hostages and the release of Isra uh, Palestinian prisoners. Uh, this really could basically begin, uh, I mean, the beginning of the end of the catastrophic situation in Gaza and the region as a whole. OK, a positive note there to finish on with Fawaz Jerjes from the London School of Economics. Pleasure talking to you. Thank you.